Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Joel Hewitt, and I'm a subject matter expert here at the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC. We are pleased to present today's webinar on Truth or Lie, Spoken Features of Trusted and Mistrusted Speech. Our presenters today are Drs. Julia Hirschberg and Sarah Ida Levitin of Columbia University. We will introduce them further in just a few minutes. The chat function is enabled in the top right hand corner of your screen, as you guys have been able to see. And please feel free to type in any questions as we go along. Our presenters will address them all during a question and answer session at the end. Please also note that we are recording the webinar, and the video webcast will be available for download from our website tomorrow. A copy of the slides will also be available for download at the end of the presentation today. So HDI is a Department of Defense sponsored entity, one of three information analysis centers. Organizationally, we fall under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC, and the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our mission is to be the go-to R&D, S&T, an RDT leader within the Homeland Defense and Security community. We achieve this by providing timely and relevant information, superior technical solutions, and high quality products to the DOD and HDS COIs and COPs. In doing so, we are able to help solve the most challenging technical problems facing the government. We pursue this mission across eight distinct focus areas. Alternative energy, biometrics, CBRN defense, critical infrastructure protection, cultural studies, homeland defense and security, medical, and weapons of mass destruction. Our external subject matter expert network is a critical tool in achieving this mission. And if you have expertise in one of our focus areas, we very much encourage you to apply. Our SMEs help us provide the military and government with the most up-to-date and cutting-edge information and innovation. So Julia Hirschberg is the Percy, Percy K. and Vita L. W. Hudson Professor of Computer Science at Columbia University. She previously worked at Bell Laboratories and AT&T Labs, where she created the HCI Research Department. She currently serves on the IEEE Speech and Language Processing Technical Committee, is co-chair of the CRAW Board, and has worked for diversity for many years at AT&T and Columbia alike. She works on spoken language processing in NLP, studying text-to-speech synthesis, spoken dialogue systems, entrainment in conversation, detection of deceptive and emotional speech, hedging behavior, and linguistic code switching. And Sarah Ida Levitin is a post postdoctoral research scientist in the Department of Computer Science at Columbia University. Her research interests are in spoken language processing, and she is currently working on identifying acoustic, prosodic, and linguistic indic indicators of trustworthy speech, as well as identifying linguistic characteristics of trustworthy news. She received her PhD in computer science at Columbia, where her dissertation addressed the problem of, of automatic deception detection from speech. She previously worked as a graduate research summer intern at Google and at Interactions LLC. And with that, Julia and Sarah, we hand it off to you. OK, thanks very much, Joel. We're very happy to be presenting this to you today. Um, this is going to be um, a talk about some of the work that we have been doing uh, for many years, actually, on recognizing deceptive speech. We'll talk about how we collected a very large corpus uh, how we have created models for machine learning models for automatic deception detection, and in particular, uh, the individual differences we have found in production and perception of deceptive speech. Uh, we'll also be talking about some current work that we are doing on identifying trusted speech versus mistrusted speech. This is speech that people trust and speech that people don't trust. We've crowdsourced ratings of our deception data to get this information, and we're comparing what people think are lies 
with what actually are lies. And we've also, of course, worked on automatic classification of trust and mistrust. So deceptive speech is typically defined as a deliberate choice to mislead without prior notification to gain some advantage or to avoid some penalty like um, being put in jail, uh, things like that. Deception does not include, however, self-deception, delusion, or pathological behavior. According to experts, pathological liars are the most difficult to identify. It also excludes theater because you know that what you're hearing is not going to be true. And it also excludes falsehoods due to ignorance or error. Now, everyday white lies are extremely hard to detect, but people um, provide at least two of those a day on average. Things like, oh, your haircut looks so great, when they don't really believe it. However, serious lies may be easier to detect, and that's what we've been finding. So serious lies um, might be easier to detect because uh, hypotheses in research and among practitioners tell us that our cognitive load is increased when we lie because, first of all, we have to keep our story straight. Uh, we have to remember what we have said and what we haven't said. And our fear of detection is increased if we believe our target is difficult to fool. For example, if they're wearing uh, a policeman's uniform. And also, our fear of the detection is increased if the stakes are high and there are serious rewards or punishments involved in being found out. So all of this makes it hard for us to control potential indicators of deception. Now, humans are very poor at detecting lies. Um, these are the results of a meta-study by Amont and Mitchell in 2004, and there have been other such study, studies as well, which shows that, in fact, criminals are the best at lie detection, and people who are associated with um, legal uh, uh, organizations like federal officers, detectives, judges even, and even the Secret Service are worse at uh, deception detection. And parole officers are the very worst because uh, they tend to believe that everything they're hearing is a lie. And human beings, normal human beings who are not really involved in um, work of detecting deception are worse than chance at deception detection. And we have found this to be true also in our studies. So current avoid, uh, approaches to deception detection, there are some automatic methods that people are not probably familiar with. Polygraphs are no better than chance, and commercial products which have been hyped after 9-11 are also no better than chance and have been demonstrated to be that poor um, explicitly. Human training, uh, for example, uh, John Reed and Associates, which Sari Eaton and I have both taken um, some training from, do behavioral an analysis and interview and er interrogation uh, types of training, but they have no empirical support for the things that they tell you to look for, except from their experience, but no quantitative uh, data. So in fact, if someone says, um, I didn't take the money versus I did not take the money, they would say that the second one, I did not take the money as a lie because you have used a contraction. However, we have found that non-native speakers tend to use contractions much less because they're not as familiar with the language. So this is one example of something that doesn't hold up. There have also been a bunch of laboratory studies, production and perception studies, on facial expression, body posture, gesture, statement analysis, brain activation even, and odor. So our goal when we started this project was to conduct ex objective experiments on human subjects to identify spoken language cues to deception. We collect speech data and extract acoustic, prosodic, and lexical features automatically. We examine individual differences of gender, ethnicity, culture, and personality factors, taking these into account as features in our classification. 
And then we use machine learning techniques to train models to classify deceptive versus non-deceptive speech. And we use these to improve deception detection by humans by creating better methods of identifying the subtle cues that humans may and do miss. And our hope is eventually to train humans as well in a form of what's now called a collaborative AI, people working with machines. So here was the process. We collect a corpus. We annotated the corpus, uh, had crowdsourcing annotation of the corpus. We did a lot of feature, feature extraction. We built classifiers, and then we analyzed the results of those classifiers. So the corpus that we have most recently collected, and this is our second, is the Columbia Cross-Cultural Deception Corpus, or CFD. In this corpus, we pair native speakers of standard American English with native speakers of Mandarin Chinese, but all of them are speaking English, and they're going to be interviewing each other. We include in, um, from our subject gender and personality information for all subjects, and we compare subjects with different cultural and language backgrounds in the results. So here was the process by which we collected the data. First, we did a background survey to collect the, some of the demographic information that we needed, which I've just described. Then we gave subjects a biographical questionnaire, in which they were supposed to answer truthfully to 24 questions. Uh, some of these questions were like, where were you born? But others were like, who ended your last romantic relationship? So we wanted to have sort of standard questions, but also more sensitive questions that might be more difficult to lie about. Once we collected the questionnaire, we asked them to come up with lies, and they had to be reasonable lies, about half of the questions. And we randomly chose the ones that they were supposed to lie about. Then we gave them a five-factor NeoFFI personality inventory to identify their personality profile. We also collected a baseline sample of their voice so that we knew what they were speaking like when they were not being interrogated. And then they, we proceeded to play a lying game in which people are going to interview each other. One person interviews the other, and then they change places about uh, the answers to those 24, 24 questions. And after that, we did a survey to understand how they thought they had judged lies and the other things. So the big uh, five Neo FFI uh, looks for personality traits like openness to experience, things like, I have a lot of intellectual curiosity, conscientiousness, I strive for excellence in everything I do, extroversion, I like to have lots of people around me, and neuroticism, I often feel inferior to others, and agreeableness, I would rather cooperate with others than compete with them. And in previous studies, we had found that people who scored high in agreeableness, openness to experience, and curiously, neuroticism, did better at detecting lies than those who did not. So here's a picture of our uh, recording booth, it's a, a sound booth that actually came originally from Bell Labs and is now in our lab. And people talking to each other, there was a curtain in between them, as you can see, the red thing, so they couldn't see each other's faces. We wanted to just collect spoken data. And these are examples, not of real subjects, but of people who were working in our labs. And the one uh, on the left-hand side is actually Sarah Isa. <laughs> long ago. Um, the motivation that we provided for each interviewer, we added a dollar for every correct judgment, whether it was about a truth or a lie, that they got right. And they lost a dollar for every time they made an incorrect judgment. And these people are writing down their uh, judgments as they go. And for an interviewee, we added a dollar for every lie that the interviewer thinks is true and they lost a dollar for every lie that the interviewer dresses correctly is a lie. So good liars tell the truth as much as possible when lying. So how do we know what's true or false for our follow-up questions? 
we had interviewees press true and false keys after every phrase to get that information. And we uh, collected all of this online. Uh, the Columbia Cross-Cultural Deception Corpus has 340 subjects. It's the largest uh, deception corpus uh, for deceptive speech that's ever been created. 340 subjects balanced by gender and native language and 122 hours of speech. So we have a lot of data to work with. We crowdsourced the transcription. Um, we did automatic speech alignment and then we did some hand correction. And interviewee speech was segmented into three different uh, units. One was interpausal units. This is just the speech between pauses of 50 milliseconds or more. One was speaker turns, which is every time you have finished answering what the other person talking, saying something and the other person starts talking. And then we did question answer sequences. So interviewers were allowed to ask a question and then to follow up with as many uh, additional questions as they wanted until they figured they had really decided whether the first answer was true or not. So here's an example that we're going to have to play for you. You want this? Oh. Okay. So the question is, did you ever cheat on a test in high school? And we have to play this uh, by the microphone. Okay, just a minute. So first of all, decide whether you think that this is true or false. Uh, no, I don't cheat. I'm a very moral person. Okay, so you might just say, maybe play it again. Uh, no, I don't cheat. I'm a very moral person. So how many people think that's truth or a lie? You can type it in the chat if you want to. Anyhow. That's true. Now let's try another one. <laughs> uh, three people got that wrong. <laughs> but it's a, we kind of chose it because it does sound a bit like a lie, but in fact it was actually true, even though she used fill pauses, which are often thought to be signals of deception. Here's another one. <laughs> to be honest, yes. How many people think that's false? <laughs> I think people are good at predicting lies. <laughs> it's false. It was a lie. Okay, now I think um, Sarita is going to talk about some of the feature extraction that we did and some of the classification experiments we did. All right. Hi, everyone. So Julia spoke a lot about the corpus that we've collected. And uh, now I'm going to talk about some of the features we've extracted, some experiments, and some of the fun results. OK. So here are, oops. OK, great. So here are some of the features that we extracted. Um, we looked at a number of both text-based features and speech-based features. So for the text-based features, we had the data set um, transcribed using crowdsourcing. And so from the, from the transcripts, we were able to extract a number of, um, of features mostly inspired by the literature from psychology and criminology on uh, what people have hypothesized are useful cues to deception. And so these include things like engrams, uh, psycholinguistic features. We use a tool for text analysis called Luke, linguistic inquiry and word count, which computes semantic categories of words. And uh, we also look at uh, word embeddings, which also capture semantic similarity of use uh, based on context. And we also extract a number of speech-based features, for example, uh, using the, the tool, an open source tool, tool called OpenSmile, um, to extract features related to pitch, intensity, speaking rate, and voice quality. And then we also are very interested in individual differences, and so we look at things like gender, the native language of the speaker, their personality scores, 
uh, and also a number of syntactic features. So here's a summary of some of the some of the findings that we found by comparing the feature distributions uh, in truthful and deceptive speech. And so we found um, for prosodic features, we found that an evidence of an increased pitch and intensity max in deceptive speech. So people tended to speak in a higher pitch and a higher intensity. So this is uh, associated with loudness when they were lying. And we also found some evidence of or speech planning. So these are, uh, we found that people tended to use filled pauses, things like um and ah, uh, more when they were lying than when they were telling the truth. And this supports the theory mentioned earlier of cognitive load, that um, when, when people are lying, there's more, uh, more things that you're keeping track of, and therefore this should result in poor speech planning, and this is something that we did find support for. Contrary to what we and others would have Expected about deception, um, people have have hypothesized that deceptive deceptive language is more simple, whereas we found that people were more descriptive and detailed and more complex when they were lying. We also found that people hedged more. So this is um, this is language that expressed uncertainty. So if you say Sort of flu. <laughs> if you say uh, this is sort of flu or I think it's raining, those are hedge words. And for truthful words, we found um, people use more cognitive process words when telling the truth, more function words. And so using these features, next we wanted to um, see whether we can train machine learning classifiers to automatically identify deception. And so we compared a number of deep learning models People are saying they are having trouble hearing. So let me see if I can raise this. All right, so here are, um, here's an overview of some of the experiments that we did. We trained a um, bidirectional LSTM model using the word embedding features. We um, trained a, another version of a deep learning model, DNN, using the acoustic features extracted with OpenSmile. And then we also created a hybrid model, which combined the, the lexical component and the acoustic prosodic component. And so let's take a look at the results. We compared performance on, on models trained on four different segmentation units, which Julia described earlier. And so you can see those in, these, um, in the different colors here. These are from shortest to longest. So IPUs are the shortest segmentation, followed by turns, followed by question responses and question chunks. And as you can see here, um, we found that these we did a lot better on, on segments that were longer and had more contextual information. And we also found, particularly for the short segments, which had less context, that our hybrid model was, was especially useful in improving performance. And next, we did more machine learning experiments using additional features. And so here you can see the results of acoustic uh, features, lexical features, syntactic features, and then various combinations. And again, we see this very clear trend that uh, contextual information seems to be extremely important. And we find that our best model, uh, which is obtained using um, all the features or or just the, the lexic or almost all the features, we see that uh, we can get about 70% accuracy um, using our automated approach, which is, uh, if you recall, the human performance, and you can see it in this red bar here, this was the human performance of interviewers in this data set. So about 54% for humans, and we're getting up to 70% for a machine learning classifier. And so this was extremely promising. And next, we wanted to see what can we learn from gender and native language. So for this analysis, we extracted simple acoustic prosodic features from question responses. And we compared distributions of features across all speakers and also broken down by gender and native language. And we did three different comparisons. First, we looked at when interviewees lie versus telling the truth to see what kinds of um, gender and native language differences we saw. Then we also looked at um, perception of deception, and we looked at when interviewees were trusted or not trusted. And trust here we're defining as if someone believes what they're saying is true. And finally, we looked at uh, when interviewers trust and looked at the traits 
of the of the person who is making the judgment. And so we we perform paired t tests to compare feature means, and we uh, control for family wise type one errors. So let's take a look at the results here. Um, so in this table, we we see in the first column the different acoustic prosodic features, and then each of the following columns shows the analysis for only that um, sub subgroup of speakers, and as well as for all speakers. And so I'll highlight some of the interesting findings here. We see that pitch max was a cue to deception across all speakers. But in the breakdown, we see that this was only significant for male speakers and native Chinese speakers. And for intensity max, we see this was a cue to deception for all groups except native Chinese speakers. Uh, interestingly, speaking rate was only a cue that was significant for native Chinese speakers. And this is a pretty intuitive finding, and we see that non-native speakers spoke faster when they were telling the truth and slower when they were lying. And so this again supports the theory that lying increases cognitive load, and we see that this effect is more pronounced when people are conversing in their non-native language. Okay, so here we see the results for, again, these group-specific cues, and here it's for trusted and mistrusted speech. So we're looking at differences across interviewee traits um, in terms of what was perceived as deceptive or truthful. And so here we see that there were some results that were consistent across groups, for example, speaking rate. Although this was not a valid cue to deception across all groups, we see that it was perceived as more truthful for all except native English speakers. And we also see considerable variation across groups. So for example, we see for pitch mean, it was only a cue to mistrust for native Chinese speakers, um, and similarly for NHR, which is a voice quality feature. Finally, we looked at um, this breakdown for interviewer traits. And so this is, um, this is looking at differences between interviewer judgments, looking at interviewer gender, interviewer language. And again, we see um, some interesting differences. So we see speaking rate was um, increased speaking rate, so faster speech was acute to trust for all groups except for female interviewers. Um, and jitter and shimmer, these are voice quality measures again, were increased in mistrusted speech only for female interviewers. So, and just an, a general observation is that we see greater differences in gender than native language when considering interviewer traits. And taken all together, we, it's, we see that gender and native language play a role both in how people produce deception and also in how people perceive deception. And so we did these really interesting experiments using the, the framework of, um, the, that we used for creating the corpus. And next, we wanted to look at um, perception of deception. Uh, instead of looking at people who were playing the role of interviewer, we wanted to see um, what, what do people trust that are completely out of the context of the conversation, complete strangers, and um, we want to understand how they perceive deception. And so to do this, we created a game, uh, which we call Lie Catcher. And lie catcher is what's what's known as a game with a purpose. And this is a game that's created for research purposes, but also has entertainment value for the players. And so the idea here is that it's a guessing game where players can listen to speech segments and they have to try to guess whether the person's lying or telling the truth, similar to what we just did earlier with the samples. And what we... Um, the, the research purpose here is that this is a nice way that we can collect perceptions of deception so people can, um, by, by saying whether they think it's true or false, they're, they're giving us these annotations of deception, which we can use to study what are the characteristics of trusted and mistrusted speech. And, um, and it's also an entertaining thing for people to play, and they can get a sense of how well they do at this task, and at the end they get a, a score report that tells them how good of a lie catcher they are. And so to, we deployed this game using uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk crowdsourcing platform. And we, um, we used 
5,340 utterances from the CXC corpus. We collected three judgments per utterance. Um, about 430 unique annotators did this task. And we also collected uh, information about their gender. And um, we also asked them for what strategies they used when making their judgments. And so the first thing we found was that this is uh, a very uh, subjective task. So here we can see in this plot uh, the number of annotators that trusted the utterances. So you can see that um, there were about 500 that nobody trusted, but then there were there were a lot of them that people didn't agree on, so only one or two annotators trusted, and then about 1750 that all three annotators trusted. And we computed the agreement for these ratings, and um, the FLICES kappa was 0.135, which indicates slight agreement. Um, it's quite low. And in general, we observed this, uh, this truth bias. So people tended to believe that their partner was telling the truth or sorry, not their partner, that the, that the speaker was telling the truth. And this um, supports the truth default theory, which states that people operate under this general assumption that people are being honest and truthful, which is a nice theory, and it's, it's nice to see that that was the case here. And we also looked at lie detection ability, and we found that confirming many other studies, and overall ours. and <laughs> ours in the in um, in the interview setting, uh, overall accuracy was just under 50%, so below random chance. We found that females were better at judging deception and also took significantly longer to judge. And we also found that people with jobs related to lie detection did not perform better and also took significantly longer to judge. Next, we analyzed the characteristics of trusted speakers. We found that female speakers were trusted more than male speakers, and native, Chinese, native English speakers were trusted more than native Chinese speakers. And we also looked at personality in, in relation to these judgments and found some interesting things. So we found people who scored low on conscientiousness were most trusted, um, people who scored high on openness to experience were most trusted, and kind of counterintuitively, we found that people who scored high in neuroticism were also trusted more than those who scored low. So we wanted to try to understand. We see this as a, a subjective task, and we see that people are doing poorly at this task. And so we wanted to understand why are people so bad at, or so poor at this task. And to do this, we, we compared features of raters' trusted and mistrusted speech with features of actual deceptive and truthful speech. So we looked at a number of features, again, inspired by uh, literature and some of our previous work on deception detection. And today I'll focus on two of these categories. We'll focus on the disfluencies and on prosody. And so we'll start by talking about disfluencies. So these are the feature sets that we extracted. Um, filled pauses are, um, we had a lexicon of filler words, things like um and ah. We also looked at response latency. So this is the time span between the interviewer question and the first non-filler word of an interviewee response. We looked at repetition. So this is if people repeat words or phrases. And we also looked at false starts, which is when speakers begin to say something and then they self-correct. Okay, so here we can see the results of this analysis. Um, the arrows are indicating the relationship between the feature and the trust, and the number of arrows is um, aligned with the statistical significance. So more is a stronger result. And so what we see here is that all of these all of these disfluency features were associated with mistrust. So people tended to trust to mistrust. Um, utterances that had more filled pauses, longer delay before answering, repetitions, and false starts. And so next, what we did was we compared these with the features of actual deception. So this is just what people perceived as truthful. And so what we see here is that filled pauses were reliable cues to deception, meaning these were actually increased in deceptive speech, and they were also perceived as more deceptive. However, the other three features, 
were, were not valid cues to deception. So people perceived repetition as being less trusted, trustworthy, but this was not actually a reliable cue to deception. People did not repeat themselves when lying. Next, we looked at prosodic features. These are the features that we examined, things, um, duration, speaking rate, and pitch and intensity features, and voice quality features. And here are the results for trust. So we see people uh, mistrusted longer responses. Um, faster responses were associated with trust. Uh, higher pitch min and a higher intensity max and mean were trusted more. Um, intensity standard deviations, this is a variation in loudness, was mistrusted. And finally, these voice quality features were increased in trusted speech. We compared these with the qualities of deceptive speech. And what we find here is that other than duration, uh, there's a complete mismatch in terms of what people perceived as deceptive and what was actually deceptive. And so this, um, this begins to shed light on possibly why people are so poor at deception detection is that what, what they're perceiving as deception is not actually uh, aligned with what is deceptive. And then in our next analysis, we looked at um, we, we focused on just the utterances that were deceptive, and we compared uh, the features of successful lies with unsuccessful lies. And so this can be, um, this can be useful if you want to know how, how to tell a believable <laughs> lie, and maybe you'll learn something useful today. So here you can see that um, it's, it's pretty intuitive. Successful lies tended to be shorter, to the point. Um, fast, had faster speech and little latency. Um, they were louder, maybe indicating more confidence, and they had fewer repetitions and filled pauses. So taking all this together, we, we see that um, there are these differences between trusted and mistrusted speech. We see that they are um, often not aligned with, with the reality. And what we were interested in doing next is to see whether we can predict trusted speech, what speech is likely to be trusted by others. And since this is a low agreement task, what we did was we only classified utterances with consensus. So we focused on the utterances that were trusted by everyone or trusted by nobody. And we trained a logistic regression classifier here, um, and we compared to a random baseline um, with an F measure of about 45. Okay, so the features that we used here, um, we used a set of NLP data-driven features, um, things like word embeddings, um, n-grams extracted from dependency parses, and also word n-grams. And then we, um, we compare these features with our hypothesized deception and trust features, which we analyzed earlier. Okay, so let's take a look at the results here. So um, in the first bar, we see the results of a random classifier, about 45%. And then we see in orange, these NLP data-driven features um, get us to about 52%. And then uh, the following bars show the, those um, more hypothesized um, deception features. So here we see disfluencies on their own are very useful about 56%, and prosody on its own is also very useful, um, with about 50%, or sorry, 55%. And then um, complexity features are also useful. Speaker traits on their own are, are not that much better than random, so that um, that's probably a good thing, and it says that we can't tell just by their traits whether they're uh, trusted or not. And then finally, we, uh, the classifier trained on all of those hypothesized deceptive features um, did uh, by far the best with about 66%. And so we see that we are able to, to automatically predict whether um, speech is likely to be trusted or not. Okay, so just to summarize here, we have studied trusted speech and found that it's a highly subjective task with poor agreement across uh, annotators in our Mechanical Turk study. We have identified characteristics of trusted speech and compared these with characteristics of deceptive speech. 
and found that there are several differences between the two. We've also analyzed individual differences in both production and perception of deception and found that there are several differences there as well. And finally, we, prepared, we, um, we trained a trust classifier with strong performance at automatically predicting speech that's likely to be trusted by others. And this work also sheds light on why people are so bad at deception detection um, because of this mismatch between perception and reality. So to conclude here, we found that we can automatically identify deception using acoustic prosodic, lexical, and personality and demographic features. And we can do this at a performance that's much better than humans. And we can also identify trust speech that humans trust and mistrust and start to understand the reasons for this mismatch between perception of deception and actual lies. And so in our ongoing and, and future research directions, we are very interested in using this information to be able to generate trusted speech automatically. And this has a number of applications in AI. If we want to create um, technology that can, um, you know, robots, maybe assistive technology that is likely to be trusted by others. And in addition, we are very interested in developing techniques and software to be able to train humans in identifying lies. Um, given that there's such poor human performance, there's a lot of room for improvement, and hopefully um, our technology can be helpful in this area. We have some more examples, oh, we or we can uh, take questions here. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll go straight to questions. We've got a, a good number already. Uh, so Ben asks whether you had tested your methods on presidential speech or perhaps um, any other public figures. Um, the answer is no. <laughs> but it's possible to do. Good, good, good answer. Uh, Cynthia asks, are there very obvious cultural differences in deceptive behaviors, or are there behaviors which are consistent across cultures? Uh, in other words, these behaviors are consistent across east to west and so on. So in this study, we looked at, um, we, we call it cross-cultural, but it's, it's limited to native speakers of Chinese and native speakers of standard American English. Of course, within those groups, there can be several different cultures. And so what we found is that, yes, there were some cues that were present across all speakers, um, both, both groups of uh, native languages. And then we also found that there were some, some differences that were really interesting. And this suggests that um, when we try to model deceptive speech, we should account for these, um, these cultural differences. So Cynthia also asks, uh, what about moral content? If the question is a yes or no question, what if my definition of cheating is more rigorous than someone else's definition, i.e., they feel they haven't cheated, but the general consensus may be that they had. They wouldn't be deceptive in their response. That point might go undetected. That's a good question. Uh, that was one thing, of course, that we didn't test for, which was what their moral um, beliefs were. So that might be something interesting, though, to do so in future. You know mm -hmm. how because we ha we have not found this, but other people studying other cultures have found that in some cultures it's perfectly okay to lie if you don't know the answer. Like if someone asks for directions, I forget what culture it is. Um, some it is a, an Asian culture, I believe. Um, people will tell you the answer even though it may be something that they have no idea because it's not polite to refuse to answer. Gotcha. Uh, someone asked for some more examples of jitter, shimmer, and NHR. Uh, that would be in my voice. <laughs> um, it is when um, the uh, pitch or the intensity of your voice varies irregularly, and you tend to have a harsh voice or um, a hoarse voice. Um, this is often true at the end of sentences, for example, and I am jittering a little bit now, I think. Ah, that's a little bit more. So it's that like that. 
That's good. That's good. Uh, Paul asks, do you think this classification process can expand over multiple languages and dialects? Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's definitely room for uh, experimenting across multiple languages. So a lot of the tools that we've used um, are available in multiple languages. Um, and so we uh, we could expand it. And yes, dialects as, dialects as well. And it's, it would be very interesting to do a similar analysis that we did all in, in um, in English, looking at these cultural and gender differences, and seeing how that um, how that is similar or different in other languages and dialects. Jen also asks, um, "What is the status of the technology at present? Is it packaged for use in trial?" No, it's not packaged for use in trial yet, or maybe ever. As Julia mentioned, we're interested in this. Um, to be used more in a collaborative way. So it's it's a bit of a dangerous thing to to take a, a classifier and use that in a, for example, in a trial to actually convict someone. Um, technologies are not perfect. As we mentioned, we have uh, about 70% accuracy, which means 30% error. And so this is um, this is not intended to be used to replace uh, a justice system that we have, but more to um, complement it. Yeah, we're thinking that possibly giving people this information who are trying to make a judgment about what somebody is saying might be helpful because a lot of the features that we found that are useful are not things that human beings standardly perceive in another person's voice. So it could be helpful, but it definitely should not be used as, I mean, there was a case of um, brain activation being used in a case in India and someone was convicted of murder because her brain activation suggested that she was not actually um, giving a truthful story, but thank goodness later it was overturned. Wow, yeah, that's a, quite an advanced use um, quite too early. That's a good segue into a question from Sadiq. He asks, what was the training accuracy in case of logistic regression? Um, so we use the logistic regression classifier to classify trusted and mistrusted speech. And so I can show, uh, here are the results for that classifier. So that's 66. Yeah, at the, the best performance with the com Combined hypothesized deception features is about 66%. Ben also asks, he says, by definition, when I know the parameters used, then I can control them to lie and get the truth outcome, correct? What was that? Can you read? Uh, so he sa oh, I'm saying that if you, if you know the features that are, were being used here, then can you use that to sort of beat the algorithm? Yeah, I think yeah. so. So, so the problem there is it's very difficult to control some of these factors. I mean, they're pretty low-level speech factors. You could, I suppose, train yourself to use particular words or not to use other words. But fixing your voice um, so that you uh, have a voice that would be trusted is going to be a difficult question. Um, the features are just very low-level. Of course, I guess if you were trained as an actor, <laughs> you might be able to do it. But it would it would take. Um, so I think what the thing is that these features that we found to be significantly correlated with lies are very hard for human beings to control. And that's one of the big criticisms of the polygraph is that they're actually uh, people who can train you in countermeasures and you can control your breathing if you practice enough. And so those are actually pretty straightforward to be, whereas this is, these are things that are a lot harder to control. Right. And if you could, you could only control a few parameters, and the other ones will slip by. It would be tough to control all of them at the same time, yes. Yeah, that makes sense. There, uh, there's a question of whether you guys, is there anything like the lie catcher game that you guys show that is presently available online? We do have a version that's online. Um, I don't know if we can show it right now on this. 
Oh, no. Probably not, but um, yeah. maybe yeah, we could probably share the link. link. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people would like to play it. It's a lot of fun. I mean, <laughs> it is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, we can share the link. Great. We will. We'll get that link, and um, when we send out an email to everyone who had attended today, we'll we'll put that in there, and everyone should be able to click. Great. Through. And if anybody has trouble using it, you can. They can just contact us. Okay. Good. Uh, I think one final question uh, for Paul. I guess the question is: Have you guys ever collaborated with Columbia professors uh, Seja and Macintosh, who work with the Army Research Laboratory Strong program? No, we haven't. I didn't know they were working with that program, or really, that they were doing Army research. Yeah, there you go. Make good connections every day. Thank you. Uh, and then I think we've got one final question. Uh, were there differences in how men and women accurately judged lies by gender? For example, were men better at detecting lies by one gender versus another? Mm, that's something that we are currently investigating. So right now we have just uh, in general, uh, for example, with this perception study, um, we found that female judges were better at judging and also that female speakers were more trusted. And so, yeah, it'd be interesting to see whether they trust, uh, let's say, female judges, trust female speakers, um, or yeah. vice versa, so that's a really interesting thing to Yeah, check. we can definitely get that with our current work, which we just, we're just collecting the uh, data on, so that'll be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. There you go, future work for a future day. Yep. All right, well, we want to thank both of you again very, very much. This has been a fascinating webinar, and thank you to all of our attendees and everyone who participated with questions, and uh, we'll call it a wrap. Thank Thanks you, again. Joel, for Thank arranging it. Bye-bye.